assistance be always with us. And may the souls of the faithful depart through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The topic of this presentation is evidence for a global flood and its importance for our times. Father Rickerberg has just given us a wonderful exposition of probably the most neglected part of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, the first perfection of the universe, which St. Thomas defines as the completeness of the universe at its first founding. All the different kinds of creatures, each one perfect according to its nature, all existing together at the same time with man and for man in perfect harmony. And this goes hand in hand with another fundamental truth that has been all but forgotten in mainstream academia, which is that this whole first perfection of the universe was a supernatural work and that the natural order, what many doctors call the order of providence, only began when the entire work of creation was finished. And St. Thomas sums that up very beautifully in the Summa when he says, in the works of nature, creation does not enter, but is presupposed to the work of nature. Therefore, we cannot study the natural order of things that we're living in and extrapolate from that all the way back to the beginning to explain how everything came to be. This is really the fundamental truth that has been obscured and our experience all over the world has been that if people can come to understand this, everything else makes sense and it's quite easy for them to embrace the traditional doctrine of creation. But if they don't understand this, then often they simply cannot get rid of their evolutionary indoctrination and, and reach the point where they can accept the truth that was revealed to us by God. Now, St. Peter, of course, predicted this predicament, and we always say that 2 Peter chapter 3 is one of the most amazing prophetic passages in the entire Bible. Because here, a man who ran a fishing business, not an intellectual, not a philosopher, predicts with pinpoint accuracy the premise that will undergird every form of evolutionary thought that comes against the beautiful traditional doctrine of creation, which is the foundation of our holy faith. He says that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the word of God in Genesis and saying things have always been the same from the beginning of creation. The amazing thing is most uh, Catholics today can hear this statement and it doesn't bother them at all. It wouldn't have bothered me for the first 30 or 40 years of my life because it's in the very air that we breathe, that the same natural processes that are going on now have been operating in more or less the same way from the beginning of the universe, the alleged Big Bang. But St. Peter is predicting this as a revolution against the truth because it's actually a lie from the pit of hell which denies the first perfection of the universe, denies that the entire work of creation was supernatural and that the natural order that we're living in did not begin until the supernatural creation was finished. But then he goes on to say that these scoffers will have to deliberately ignore the fact, not the pious belief, but the fact that it was the word of God, the fiat of God, that brought the heavens and the earth and all they contain into existence. Not a natural process like a supernova explosion. And he says these scoffers will have to also ignore the fact 
that the whole face of the earth was changed by a global flood in the time of Noah. And sure enough, this evolution revolution begins not with Darwin, not even with the geologists, but with the philosophers. René Descartes is the first baptized Catholic scoffer who, after dabbling in the occult, living an extremely immoral life, he had three mystical dreams in which he said a spirit of truth possessed him and put him on this path to develop this wonderful new way of thinking that would change the way everybody thought. And one of those wonderful new ideas that he got from the spirit of truth, alias Lucifer, was that it's more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature, like stars or plants or animals, in terms of the same natural processes that are going on now, instead of this strange idea that things just popped into existence whole and complete in the beginning. Well, Descartes' words were put on the index of forbidden books, and no theologian worth his salt would have considered this anything but absurd. But little by little, this revolutionary idea insinuated itself into the minds of the almost the entire intellectual elite of Christendom until today it's in the very air that we breathe. Now Blaise Pascal was every bit as great a genius as René Descartes, but the big difference between them is that Blaise Pascal actually loved our Lord Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, and he saw that if René Descartes' false philosophy were ever widely accepted, it would do untold harm to humanity. And so he wrote in Pensee, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God. Oh, he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with a flip of his thumb, the big bang, if you will. After that, he had no more use for God. What an amazing insight. He saw that if things have always been the same from the beginning of the universe, if the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in more or less the same way from the very beginning, all we need God for is to start everything in motion. The Big Bang, if you will. After that, we don't need Him because we can study what's going on here and now and with our brilliant minds, we can extrapolate from that all the way back to the beginning and explain how everything came to be all by ourselves. We don't need any revelation from God. We don't need any action by God where he supernaturally creates the things that we see. Now, the next wave of revolutionaries were not yet the Darwinians, it was the evolutionists, I mean the geologists, excuse me, because Charles Lyell and James Hutton took the false philosophy of René Descartes and Immanuel Kant and the other Enlightenment philosophers and made that the guiding principle of everything that they did in the field of geology. So they said, if things have always been the same from the beginning, then the present, which we can observe, is the key to the past. And they made this the guiding principle for everything that they did. Now, of course, the problem with this is that it's not only wrong, it's the opposite of the truth. Because the reality is, there are three supernatural realities that we have to understand in the past if we're going to even begin to understand reality in the present. Number one, there was a supernatural creation. Number two, there was a supernatural divine judgment upon the whole universe at the time of the original sin, which changed the entire universe, made the entire universe subject to a bondage to decay, as St. Paul says in Romans 8. And then there was another supernatural judgment upon the whole world at the time of the Noachic Flood. 
which, as St. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, destroyed the world as it was. The world that then was perished in the flood. So Satan was able to do some of the most intelligent people who have ever walked the earth into believing something that is not only wrong, but the opposite of the truth, and then making that their guiding principle for everything that they thought and did. Now remember that geology in the days of Lyle and Hutton, the end of the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century, was not what it is today. These people had no facilities for doing real experimental research in the field of sedimentology, as we have now. No, being a geologist meant taking walks in the countryside and speculating about how they might have formed. And these men were speculating with their guiding principle, the present is the key to the past. So it's no surprise that they got it completely wrong. Lyle and Hutton imagined that since we don't see anything like a global flood, that obviously is just a fairy tale. No, what we see are slow and gradual localized processes. So they imagined that great bodies of water came over the land, sediment settled out, the waters withdrew, the sediment hardened into rock, and then this happened over and over again, over eons of time. And of course, if that were true, which it isn't, then when we go to the big sedimentary rock formations all over the earth, like the Grand Canyon, we can be sure that the layer at the top must have been formed very recently compared to the ones at the bottom, which must have formed eons ago. And if that were true, but it isn't, then of course the fossils in the sedimentary rocks might seem to tell the story of life developing from the simpler to the more complex, from the fish to the amphibian to the reptile to the bird to the mammal and finally to man. And that's how we get Darwin. Darwin's wild speculations in biology are completely based on Lyle and Hutton's wild speculations in geology, which are totally based on Descartes' false philosophy that he got from the spirit of truth, alias Lucifer. It's a house of cards. But that's how we get the tree of death. And we should never allow our children or grandchildren to call this the tree of life, because it's 550 plus million years of death and destruction that the god little g of evolution requires to get from the bottom to the top of the tree of death so that humans can come into the world. So, the global flood is something we have to be willing to defend to the death because this is not something that is just a minor detail. This is one of the most significant events in the history of the whole world and we'll see at the end of this presentation that in our time, it is absolutely necessary for every Catholic to believe correctly in the reality, the historical reality of the global flood. Now, I'm going to speak mainly about the scientific evidence for the global flood, but I want to just speak very briefly about uh, a few simple <coughs> theological arguments for the global flood and they're listed here. Number one, our Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, testified to the reality of the global flood. Now, that should really be sufficient to settle the question, and there's absolutely no doubt about it. When our Lord talks about his second coming, which will be a global event, which will affect every creature on earth when it occurs, the only event of its kind that he can compare it to is the Noachic Flood, because that is also an event which affected every creature on Earth at the time that it occurred. Secondly, all the Church Fathers testify to the reality of the Global Flood. And two ecumenical councils defined Trent and Vatican I that when all the fathers of the church agree on any interpretation of scripture that pertains to a doctrine of faith or morals, that is the truth and we have to accept it. Now some people would say, well this, this doesn't affect a doctrine of faith or morals, but it does. Because we can see 
that the fathers, the doctors, and the popes down through history have definitely seen the Ark of Noah as a foreshadowing of the church. And just as there was no life that was preserved outside of the ark, no human life was preserved outside of the ark, so there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. So there's definitely, um, there's definitely a very good argument to be made that the Noachic Flood has very serious implications for faith and morals. And if all the fathers agreed that the Noachic Flood was a real historical event and was global in extent, we must accept that. Number three, the words in Hebrew and Greek that are used to describe the Noachic Flood are unique. They are never used about any kind of local flood. There are other words to describe a normal flood, a local flood. They're never used to describe the Noachic Flood. In the Septuagint and in the New Testament, the Greek word is cataclysmos, which is where we get our English word cataclysm. This is only used for the Noachic Flood because it's a totally unique event. It's never been repeated and it never will. When our Lord tells his parable about a man who builds his house on sand and the flood comes and washes it away, he doesn't use cataclysmos because there are other words in Greek and in Hebrew to describe that kind of a flood, which is part of our normal experience. So this is a very clear and strong argument that the Noachic flood is unique in the history of the world. Number four, why should Noah spend many decades building an ark for his family and all the different kinds of animals if the flood that God is going to send as a chastisement is a local flood. He could simply have told Noah, I want you to move over a few valleys. As he told Abraham to move far from his homeland, he could have done exactly the same. And instead of directing the animals into an ark, which was completely useless, or at least unnecessary, he could have simply directed them to follow Noah over a few valleys to an area that would not be submerged by the flood. By teaching our children and grandchildren that the Noachic flood was a local flood, we destroy their reverence for the word of God and the tradition of the church. This is how we drive young people out of the church, because we tell them things that are completely nonsensical to any person who stops to think about them for 30 seconds. No, the only reason why it made sense for God to tell Noah to make an ark for his family and for all the different kinds of animals is because there wasn't going to be any place left on the face of the earth that would be safe for them because the entire earth was going to be submerged under the flood waters. And finally, a local flood would make God a liar. God clearly promises Noah that never again will he judge the earth with water. Now, if the Noachic flood was a local flood, then the Jonestown flood and all the floods that we've had all over the earth for thousands of years make God a liar. And this is another way that we destroy the faith of our children and our grandchildren and drive them out of the church. They're not stupid. If God promised never to send another flood, and the flood was a local flood, and they know that there have been hundreds of thousands of local floods in the last several thousand years, then God is a liar. The Bible is a joke, and our faith is not worth taking seriously. But let's look at the physical evidence. I've broken it down into six categories. Number one, we have eyewitness testimony from all over the world to the historical reality of the flood. Number two, we find marine fossils on top of all of the Earth's highest mountains. Number three, we find billions and billions of well-preserved fossils of all kinds of creatures all over the Earth. Number four, we have sediment layers that cover vast areas, even entire continents, even spreading from one continent to another. Number five, we don't see evidence of erosion between these layers of sediment. We find evidence of very rapid deposition of one vast layer on top of another. And finally, all over the earth, 
we find oversized rivers with itty bitty rivers running through them, oversized valleys, excuse me, with little rivers running through them, and we find water gaps which are very difficult to explain in an evolutionary framework. So let's look through these very quickly. There are a number of researchers who have looked at the flood legends that have been preserved by hundreds of people groups all over the world, and they have looked at the content of these traditions which have been handed down from generation to generation in just about every people group on the face of the earth. And what these researchers have found is a great many remarkable similarities between these various accounts from hundreds of different groups of people and the Mosaic account. Now, not surprisingly, there are some things uh, that are clearly incorrect in some of these traditions, and we find that the farther the people migrated away from the Near East, the greater the discrepancy between the tradition and the Mosaic account. But nevertheless, we find a remarkable similarity among all of these different accounts from people groups all over the entire Earth. And the most logical explanation for this is not that we have a collective unconscious wherein we have some kind of memory of a flood that never happened. No, the most logical explanation for the fact that groups of people all over the world remember an historical event and describe it in very similar ways is that that historical event actually occurred. And what these people remember is not a local flood. What they all remember is a flood that covered the entire earth in which one family was saved on one vessel that was able to survive in the waters of the flood. Now all over the earth we find very tall mountains and on the tops of those tall mountains we find fossils of marine creatures, creatures that used to live at the bottom of the sea. Now, this is rather difficult to explain within an evolutionary framework, but it's very easy to explain within the true Catholic framework. Now, Voltaire is famous for having said that the reason that we find seashells at the tops of mountains is because pilgrims went there and dropped them. Well, I'm sorry, Voltaire, that explanation really isn't going to hold water because I don't know how many pilgrims made it to the top of the Andes Mountains or some of these other places that to this day are not frequented by followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I think we'll have to set Voltaire's hypothesis aside in favor of common sense which tells us that the reason why these mountains have marine fossils on top of them is because at one time the waters covered them and when they were uplifted they were raised up with these marine fossils embedded in their rocks. Now we also find all over the earth um, billions and billions of marine creatures that have been buried in enormous graveyards which are completely different from anything that is going on in the world today. I mean, completely different. For example, here's the red wall limestone in the Grand Canyon. And this fossil graveyard contains billions of nautiloids. And this graveyard stretches for 180 miles across several states. What kind of local flood, what kind of deposition that's going on now or in historical times could produce something like this. There's simply no parallel. Now, the mere fact that we have all over the earth billions and billions of beautifully preserved fossils is in and of itself a very strong evidence for the Noachic flood because fossilization is a very rare occurrence. In the woods around here, animals are dying all the time. Squirrels are dying, deer are dying, raccoons are dying. How many of them will be fossilized? Zero. <coughs> fossilization requires very special conditions. You have to have a creature buried in sediment that entombs that creature very rapidly and then allows the preservation of the 
hard structure of the creature in what turns into a fossil. Now, this is not going on in the ordinary course of nature. There are billions of creatures dying all over the earth today. They're not going to be turned into fossils. And yet, all over the earth, we find billions and billions of all kinds of creatures beautifully preserved. And this is a very clear indication that all over the earth, there was some kind of very special event which produced these fossils. Now, we get a clue as to what that event was when we look at sedimentary layers that cover entire continents and often stretch from one continent to another. This is an example of a sedimentary layer that covers much of North America. Here we have the White Cliffs of Dover made up of chalk beds which stretch from southern England all the way across Europe to the Middle East. Now what kind of deposition that's going on in the ordinary course of nature can produce this kind of sedimentary deposition of an, over an area that huge? There's simply no analog in our normal experience. We find the same thing with coal seams. When you drive through the Midwest and you get into some hillier areas than we have close to here, we, we're used to seeing coal seams in the road cuts along the side of the road. But do we reflect on the fact that these coal seams extend from the Midwest of the United States all the way to Europe and extend all the way to what was once part of the Soviet Union? These are the same deposits extending over these enormous areas. It's clear that there is no kind of slow and gradual localized process that can produce this kind of sedimentary deposition. Now then when we look at these layers, which are deposited over vast areas of the Earth, we're then struck by the fact that if these layers had been laid down over hundreds of millions of years, as evolutionary mythology requires, we would have to find evidence of a great deal of erosion between the layers, because life is always going on, and it's always very destructive of sedimentary deposits. The fact that we find layer after layer covering enormous areas with no evidence whatsoever of any kind of erosion or deformation between the layers is a very strong indication that these massive amounts of sediment were laid down one on top of the other over the entire Earth. And of course, we have other evidence that points to that conclusion. For example, we have what are called polystrate fossils. Trees, for example, that extend through many, many sedimentary layers. It's obvious that this tree didn't stand there for hundreds of thousands of years while sediments gradually built up around it, as Charles Lyell and James Hutton imagined was the case. No, the only reason why we have this tree preserved the way that it is is because it was very rapidly buried, and that's why it was able to be preserved. We've even found whales buried in a vertical position, perfectly preserved. Now, the whale didn't stand on its tail for 100,000 years while sediment gradually built up around it so it could be preserved. Obviously, the whale was swept into this position, buried rapidly in a catastrophic uh, sedimentary deposit. And this brings us to a very important point, which is that Lyle and Hutton left out of account the most important factor in sedimentary deposition in the real world. And that is moving currents of water. Because it so happens that in the real world, as opposed to the unreal world of evolutionary conjecture, sediments are normally laid down, not for still by still water, but by moving water. And we now have, and we've had for many decades, laboratories where scientists can do real empirical research and study how sediments are laid down by moving currents of water in the real world. And what they have discovered completely contradicts the conjectures and speculations of Lyle and Hutton, 
whose work was the absolute foundation for everything that Darwin wrote in Origin of Species. He says so himself. The reality is that in the real world, moving currents of water carry sediments and deposit them according to their physical characteristics in a number of different variables. And therefore, when we, if we have a massive local flood, for example, we can have sediment being deposited here at the same time as sediment is being deposited up there. When this flood is over and this deposit hardens, if Charles Lyell takes a walk in the countryside, he's going to imagine that this sediment over here was deposited hundreds of thousands of years before this one up here. In reality, they were deposited at exactly the same time. Now, one of the scientists associated with the Kobe Center, Guy Berto, has done extensive research with other geologists, especially in the Russian Federation, taking this empirical research that has been done in world-class sedimentological laboratories and applying it to the examination of massive sedimentary rock formations all over the Earth. And here's an example of uh, a drawing that they published in a, a peer-reviewed geological journal showing that if you actually analyze the Tonto group, which is a, a massive section of the Grand Canyon, in light of this empirical research, you can see when you examine the makeup of the Tonto group that it is the result of a massive amount of water moving across the southwestern United States and depositing these sediments laterally and vertically at the same time, and that this entire formation could easily have been laid down in a matter of days or weeks. It did not take hundreds of millions of years. Now, we also find that when we look at the rock layers in the Grand Canyon, we do not see evidence of erosion between the layers, which we ought to see. If they were laid down over hundreds of millions of years, we should see evidence of all kinds of biological activity. We don't see it. We see layer upon layer, beautifully laid one on top of the other. And what we also see when we look at the Rocky Mountains or the Alps or any of the great mountain ranges all over the Earth is that when the mountains were uplifted, the sedimentary layers within those mountains were folded at very sharp angers, angles without any evidence of deformation or shattering when the uplift occurred. Now, if these sediments had been laid down over hundreds of millions of years, they would have hardened. And when the uplift occurred, we would see the evidence of shattering, we'd see the evidence of deformation. We don't see that. We see these beautiful layers folded at very sharp angles in the Rocky Mountains, for example, showing that these layers were moist, they were wet and malleable at the time that the uplift occurred. And that, of course, is consistent with the truth that they were laid down as a result of the Noachic flood. Now, another interesting thing is that you may have noticed that when you drive around this country or even other parts of the world in a valley, I live in the Shenandoah Valley, and you can see this very clearly, <coughs> Have you ever wondered about the fact that in all of these valleys, you have enormous valleys, and you have these tiny little pencil-thin rivers running through them? How did that happen? How did a little trickle of water in relation to this enormous valley carve out the valley? It doesn't make any sense in the evolutionary framework, but it makes perfect sense within the Noachic framework, the framework of the Noachic flood. Because what happened was, as the waters ran off the continents, they carved out these enormous valleys. But once they had finished running back into the ocean basins, all that was left was a relic of those massive waters. And that's what we see in the river systems all over the Earth. But there's something else that we see which is very interesting. And it's something you can look for when you go on a, a long drive, as some of you have done and will be doing again in a few days. And that is, you'll find along the sides of the valleys cuts in the side of the valley, but there's no water coming through them. What are they doing there? 
did somebody go up there and carve out <laughs> this hole in the side of a valley? No, what happened was when the waters were running off the continental land services back into the ocean basins, in the beginning, there were various channels. And those various channels cut these notches in the sides of the river valleys. But eventually, what happens? The water is all going to look for the fastest route back into the oceans. So eventually, some of those channels converged and carved out the bigger openings and left the smaller ones without any apparent cause. Now, evolutionary geologists have a very hard time coming up with a good explanation for these water gaps, but it's very easy for us to explain them in light of the Nalagic flood. Now, something else that is particularly interesting to me as someone that's been blessed to visit the African continent several times is that 60% of the African continent is what's called a planation surface. It's an enormous area that has been leveled, completely leveled. Now, what do we see happening in the world today or in historic times that can completely level 60% of a massive continent? There's nothing that can even begin to explain it. But it's very easy to explain in light of the Noachic flood. Because as those flood waters were flowing across the African continent back into the ocean basins, they literally planed these surfaces. And you can see them today. And that is very easy to explain within the framework of the Noachic flood. Now, we know from God's revelation through Moses that the Noachic flood occurred and it was a global flood. But Moses does not give us a great deal of information about the mechanism of the global flood. So as Catholics, we need to distinguish between things that are clearly set forth in the Holy Scriptures, which we must accept, and other things which are not explained, where it's perfectly legitimate to formulate different hypotheses. So there are different hypotheses about what caused the Noachic Flood. Now clearly, the Noachic Flood was a supernatural judgment upon a sinful world. So we can't explain it completely in terms of natural processes. But there were natural processes that were at work in the Noachic Flood, and it's perfectly legitimate to try to understand what could have produced the world that we see today that resulted from the Flood. So I'm just going to present one hypothesis to you for your consideration. There are others. You can examine them for yourself and decide which one you think best explains the evidence. The one that I'm going to very briefly explain is catastrophic plate tectonics. And one of the main uh, scientists who uh, proposes this model is a scientist called Dr. John G Baumgartner, who's generally recognized even by the secular geophysicists as one of the world's leading experts, if not the leading expert, in computer modeling of geophysics. So we know that all the continents fit together like pieces of a puzzle. Not perfectly, but, but quite well. And this is now pretty much accepted by all geologists that in the beginning there was one Pangaea, there was one continental landmass, and that as a result of the flood, we would say that one landmass was broken up into the continents that we see today. Now, it's interesting that in Genesis, Moses tells us that God gathered the waters into one place and made the dry land appear. And that would seem to be consistent with the fact that there was one Pangaea in the beginning. And in 1859, when Darwin published Origin of Species, uh, a, a man named Antonio Snyder published a book in which he argued from Genesis that there was one landmass in the beginning which was broken up into the continents. And I think we could say that Antonio Snyder is much more deserving of being remembered for his contribution today than Charles Darwin, but almost nobody knows anything about him. Now, what Dr. Baumgartner and his colleagues point out 
is that uh, there do appear to be plates on the earth which are moving today very, very slowly, just centimeters per year. And the evolutionary community argues that these plates have been moving at the same rate for, of course, hundreds of millions of years, and that's how they explain how we could start with one continent and end up with the continents that we have and still maintain the evolutionary time scale. But Dr. Baumgartner, through his computer modeling, says this does not explain the evidence at all. Because he points out that we have definite evidence that there were um, huge pieces of rock from the ocean that at some point plunged into the mantle of the earth and started what could easily have been the mechanism or part of the mechanism for the global flood. And he points out that when we use a certain kind of imaging uh, called seismic tomography, we can see that there's a ring of dense rock at the bottom of the mantle. And this, as he says, corresponds approximately to the entire perimeter of the Pacific Ocean. And it appears to be this ocean crust that at some point plunged into the mantle of the Earth. Now, if the evolutionary story is true and these plates have been moving apart a few centimeters every year, over those hundreds of billions of years, we would expect there to be a uniform temperature among all of these different bits of material. But that's not what we find. What we find is this material that seems to have subducted or dove into the mantle of the Earth is of a drastically different temperature from the surrounding rock. And this tells us that this event, when this ocean rock subducted, could only have occurred thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. Because if it had occurred millions of years ago, over that amount of time, the temperature would have become uniform throughout all of this material. Now, here's an example of where there's a, a huge amount of subductive rock in the Tonga Trench. And all that blue is of a much different temperature than the surrounding material. Again, this is an indication that when this material was subducted down into the mantle, it happened not very long ago because it's still a very different temperature from the surrounding material. And Dr. Baumgartner argues that this can explain many things because as this ocean rock plunged into the mantle, magma came up from inside of the earth and a crack opened up all around the earth like the seam on a baseball. And as this hot magma came up, it superheated the water and created fountains shooting up water all around the earth. And this would seem to fit what Moses tells us that at the beginning of the flood, all the fountains of the great deep were opened up. And of course, when this happened, the level of the ocean would have been lifted up, the waters would have become warmer, and that would have inundated the surface of the earth. Something very interesting about this also is that the kinds of magmas that would be generated by this phenomenon are exactly the kind that would put all kinds of material into the atmosphere, which would then block out the light of the sun or substanti substantially reduce it. And this is very important because the only thing that can really explain a global ice age or, an, or a very extensive ice age is a global flood. Because whenever you try to model a slow and gradual global ice age, it never works. Because the colder the air becomes, the less moisture it can hold. And you can't have a global or very extensive ice age unless you have massive amount of amount, amounts of precipitation. 
the global flood, flood gives you the unique conditions that could allow for a global ice age because you have enormous amounts of water in the atmosphere. Then because of all the volcanic activity, you have all this debris going up into the atmosphere and blocking the light of the sun, so your temperature plummets and all of this moisture precipitates now as snow and ice, but on a scale far beyond anything that we can even imagine, far beyond anything that we have experienced in historical times. And this explains why the evidence points to a global flood approximately 4,500 years ago, followed by a global or very extensive ice age that lasted about 500 to 700 years. Now, one of the things that our children are told is that not only was Noah's Ark uh, or Noah's flood a local flood, but Noah's Ark was, was just something to, you know, ride out the local flood. There was nothing special about it. And of course, this borders on blasphemy because the reality is naval engineers, people who make ships for a living, have studied the dimensions of the Ark and the specifications that Moses relates in Genesis and have found that the Ark of Noah was perfectly designed for what it was intended to do, which was not to get from point A to point B, but to ride out the, the wind and the waves of the worst watery cataclysm that has ever existed. And these uh, South Korean engineers determined that this Ark was so well designed, so perfectly designed, to ride out the flood, that it could have withstood waves 100 feet tall because of the specific design that it had. Now we also uh, can do a very interesting extrapolation to show that not only is there a lot of evidence for a global flood, but evidence in other areas that we can look at are very consistent with the data that Moses gives us. For example, Moses tells us that everyone on earth today is a descendant of one of the, one of the three sons of Noah, and that 4,500 years ago, approximately, there were only eight human beings on the earth. Now, from historical research, we know that the average rate of population growth based on several hundred years of reasonably good data is about half of 1% per year. Now if we take roughly half percent per year annual population growth and we start 4,500 years ago with eight people, we end up with about 6.5 billion in the year 2000. That is almost exactly the population of the earth in the year 2000. That's starting from the myth of Genesis. Now if we start with the science of evolution, a typical textbook tells our children and grandchildren that there might have been two people who evolved from subhuman primates 500,000 years ago. Okay, so let's take half a percent growth per year for 500,000 years. <laughs> We'd have to get rid of all the atoms in the world to make room for all the people. So we end up with a result which is completely outrageous and absurd and yet this is what we're allowing to be taught to our children as science while we tell them that Genesis is just a myth. And that's not the only remarkable thing that we find. We find that when uh, geneticists look at the mitochondrial DNA from women in every people group on Earth, it's remarkably similar. It's obvious that every woman on Earth today is descended from one woman and every man on Earth from Y chromosome research is descended from one man. But what is fascinating about the mitochondrial DNA is that it still groups into three very similar but distinct lineages, whereas the Y chromosome is more uniform, the Y chromosome data. Now why would that be? Well, we know, Moses tells us, that on the ark were Noah and his wife, the three sons of Noah who got their Y chromosome from Noah, but then there were these three wives. 
we don't get more information about them, but it makes perfect sense that if they came from different families, that we would see in the mitochondrial DNA lineages some distinction, and that's exactly what we find. So to sum up, um, we, well, I don't have time to sum up, so I'm just gonna ask you to remember everything that I said. <laughs> because, um, I need to conclude by speaking of the importance of holding fast to the literal historical truth of the Mosaic account of the flood. There have been a number of genuine mystics approved by the Catholic Church who have testified to the importance of the Noachic flood for our generation. Blessed Elena Mariello, shown here, was beatified by Pope Benedict XVI very recently. She was the founder of a religious congregation and lived until very recently. And our Blessed Mother told her that the people of modern times are worse than the people before the Noachic flood. Now that's something to think about because Moses tells us that before the flood, God saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth and that all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil at all times. In other words, there must have been some false way of thinking that had entered into the very air that people breathed on the eve of the Noachic flood so that even people who wanted to do the right thing were being influenced away from the truth and away from God and away from goodness to evil. And I think evolution fits the bill and the whole Cartesian, Darwinian way of thinking fits the bill as that evil way of thinking that has become part of the very air that we breathe today so that even good people, even people who are trying to do God's will are being influenced to move away from the truth, away from God, and away from his will. And of course, on October 13, 1973, in Akita, Japan, in a message that was published by the local ordinary with the explicit uh, permission and encouragement of then Cardinal Ratzinger, the Blessed Virgin said that if man does not repent, and this is 1973, the anniversary, uh, of course, the year of Roe versus Wade, when abortion on demand was legalized here, which then we've helped to spread throughout the world. If man does not repent, the Heavenly Father will inflict a punishment worse than the deluge, such as one will never have seen before. Fire will fall from the sky, wiping out a great part of humanity. So what happens when we don't hold fast to the literal historical truth of the Noachic flood is that we easily fall into thinking that things just go on the same. God does not <coughs> intervene. God does not judge sin and rebellion when it becomes widespread among mankind. And that, of course, is another lie from the pit of hell. So it is extremely important that we hold fast to the literal historical truth of the Mosaic account of the flood and help our Catholic brothers and sisters to do the same. Because when we do that, we remember that God is sovereign. And as he judged the whole world in the time of Noah, he will judge this entire world again and very soon if we do not repent in short order. This killing of innocent and destroying of innocence all over the world, it's not going to be allowed to continue. But if a person does not believe in the literal historical truth of the Mosaic account of the flood, they're not going to be motivated in the same way to repent and to try to bring others to repentance in every possible way. Now the good news is we know that God has given us an ark in these times. We're not being threatened with a watery deluge, we're being threatened with fire from heaven that will kill most of the people on earth, but allow God to start over again if we're not going to repent. But he's given us an ark, and the ark is the immaculate heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So 
One of the reasons why we need to hold fast to the literal historical truth of the global flood is so that it will give us the proper sense of urgency to bring every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth into the ark of the Immaculate Heart of Mary so that everyone that we can possibly bring into the ark will consecrate himself or herself to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and live their consecration in every thought, every word, and every action. Because that is the first thing that Our Lady of Fatima asked for. And that is what is necessary to bring about the rest of the things that she prophesied, that she promised. Remember she said, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. That's an interior triumph. The triumph of her Immaculate Heart is not something that's happening outside, it's something that's happening within. That is going to happen when there are enough Catholics who are truly consecrated to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and who are living our consecration in, in every moment of every day. When there are enough of us doing that, that will bring down the grace for what? For the Pope to consecrate Russia by name to the Immaculate Heart of Mary with all the bishops. We cannot blame the popes for not doing what Our Lady asked them to do because we haven't done what she asked us to do. The five first Saturdays, the true consecration, living our consecration in every moment of every day. When we do that, when enough of us do it, that will bring down the grace for the consecration, which he said will come. It will be late, but it will come. And when the Holy Father, with all the bishops, consecrates Russia by name to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we have her promise. Russia will be converted. Russia will come back into communion with the Catholic Church and will become, together with Ukraine, a light to every nation on earth. And then we will have the greatest evangelization that the world has ever seen in the period of peace that will be granted to the world. And so we can only say Our Lady of Fatima, spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.